books in that they, uh, they were all kind of set with this idea of uh, really living in the ruins of kind of advanced super science civilizations that had risen and fallen. So you've got, you know, branches of humanity who had kind of gone off and evolved into the kind of the singularity that a lot of science fiction authors write about and have become kind of AI based gods. And, uh, but for, for the sort of the person on the street, you know, they've got no idea of, of that kind of great big debris of civilization that they're living in. You know, they're, they're just really viewing it through that kind of very simple prism uh, of, of Victorian times, which was very important to me. And I also wanted a kind of a high adventure concept as well. So, you know, all the things that appealed to me as a kid were things like Three Musketeers and sabre fighting and that kind of thing. And I was very influenced also by the aesthetic of the Old Republic serials of the 1930s, so things like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Uh, but I think if, if you're trying to put those into a world and really make it totally coherent as to why they're there, it, it can be quite difficult. Uh, because, you know, when you think about it, if you've got a, a world where you've got guns and pistols and rifles, why on earth would you have somebody having a sabre fight or a lightsaber fight? There isn't that much reason for it, but obviously uh, you can get away with it in space opera. And George Lucas did it to great effect in Star Wars. I think with Star Wars, again, you have, you have an example of a world that is probably over-detailed and it can actually come across a bit kind of uh, nerdy on the details, I guess, when you, you see things like the Clone War series and they kind of launch with those great big scrolling backstories about you know trade deals and the Federation and droids and that kind of thing. I think they can also get away or get in the way a bit of, of people's writing and their enjoyment about it. It's actually become a bit of a, an obsession with me in that I love looking at books and seeing how they actually are written from the point of view of the author. I, indeed, I actually find it very difficult now to read for enjoyment. So when I, when I try and read, I'll read things normally outside of the science fiction field and sort of see how they actually got to where they got to uh, and how they've handled some of the similar issues. One of, one of the best-selling books at the moment in the UK is a, a series of, of Cheetah-based crime novels by a writer called C.J. Samson. And, um, they're absolutely, if you're, if you're a writer, I heavily recommend reading these just to see how he's done it because you've got this amazing amount of detail of the Tudor world of politics and the technology of the time and how, how he's gone about it, actually integrating it into the story with a very light touch. Uh, and it would be very easy to do that in a way that would just totally put off readers and make them not want to read the book. But as far as the way he's done it, it's very, very light on its... On, on its heels, if you like, and you don't really, you don't really feel that you're kind of getting in the way of, you know, the fact that society in those days didn't have sewers. But he, he just, just describes it perfectly as he's kind of moving through that Tudor cityscape. The fact that there's, you know, sewage running down the streets, and he gets he gets into the mindset of that society very well, which I think is is the the mark of a, a true writer or a true artist. I mean, it, it's very easy. Uh, as authors or as fantasy authors, you kind of create this world of, you know, horse and cart and swords and ships, and you've got your kind of your pseudo religion and your your pseudo history. It's very very difficult for modern people to get back into the mindset of what it was actually like to be a person in in a Victorian society or to be a person in a medieval society, because you're really viewing it before your sensibilities as a you know a modern citizen of the 21st century. But you know, in those days, you know, how would they view religion? I mean, we all view religion with a great degree of suspicion in many cases, and, and you know, we, we've sort of gone through the through the Reformation and the Enlightenment. But to them, you know, God was real, and you know, what the priests said was real. And you know, hey, they fought great big religious wars over it. And they took it all very seriously, and would you know, happily murder each other over lunch, over you know, these the slight disagreements in you know, religious theology and that kind of thing. To actually get into the mindset of those people in a way that is interesting it is really what you should be aiming for as an author. Uh, it's, it's certainly what I've tried to do with, with some of the sort of Victorian things. Um, okay. Can I just ask, how, how long am I on for? Well, time's up. Well, it's half an hour, so we have one third of the time. I, I, okay. if, if anyone has questions, maybe now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, sir. If, if there's any questions about. Uh, well, maybe I well, can start. Yeah. 
you answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what science fiction, what are your science fiction ideas like? Well, I would say my science fiction ideas are probably very much in, in the vein of Ian M. Banks and the Culture series in the UK. Uh, he's one of my favourite authors, and I think he's a, he's a good example of somebody that, uh, if you've ever read his books, they're, they're not really heavy, hard science fiction. Um, you look at somebody, say, like Stephen Baxter in the UK, who's come from a real science background, and, you know, there are lots of fascinating, high, high kind of scientific concepts being worked into his books. And in America, Greg, Greg Bear, I think, would fall into the similar camp. You've got, you know, whatever is cutting edge in the way of... Uh, you know, science fiction or science, I guess, you know, quantum weaponry and all this kind of thing, singularities as weapons, you know, they, they get worked into, into the books, again, with a very light touch, but, you know, they, they are replete with details, but I think on, on the opposite end of the scale, you have the kind of space opera of Ian M. Banks, which, again, is very light. If you look at the terminology used in those books, there's very little in the world of world creation to get in the way of the plot. I mean, you have spaceships and you have aliens. And, you know, they might actually have a you know an alien-sounding name, but again, he's not really getting into the whole thing of uh, you know you know days being called zargs and this kind of thing. Um, and I think also if you look at what's popular in American science fiction, they often you often they're almost written like techno thrillers, but with a very simple singular scientific idea at the core of it and I think the exemplar of that technique at the moment is people like Robert J. Sawyer which is why the TV people love him because you can basically take that simple concept and make a science fiction series out of it like flash forward but you're not really having to do a great SFX budget for aliens and spaceships and that kind of thing you just have that one concept of or what if we could all see you know a couple of you know, years or I think it was six months in the TV series into the future, what would happen? And uh, Corey Doctorow, of course, is another one in, in the States who's had a lot of success, but you know, he sort of looks at those kind of simple scientific ideas of, of what's happening at the moment in society or the internet, uh, and Charles Cross to a certain degree, although I guess he does do space opera as well. You know, they'll look at those kind of things as well, you know, people doing computer games and being paid in the third world to, to mine. Uh, you know, gold points for, for players, rich players in the Western world, and hey, what happened if you have a murder over those and you can make a book about that? But uh, really, you've got very little science fiction baggage or creative world baggage to get in the way of, of making that a bestseller. And indeed, they're also very easy to fill because, like I say, very little in the way of SFX budgets. Uh, it's one of, one of my kind of bugbears is that uh, in, in the early days when I, when I first got published, um, there was a lot of kind of buzz about, oh, for the first book because uh, it had gone to auction and all the, all the British publishers had been bidding for it. And off the back of that, it was actually the Court of the Air was selected for the Berlin Art Film Festival to be presented to all the film producers. And this is the largest film festival for professionals in the world. So about 100,000 directors and Hollywood types get together there. And it was, I think the elevator pitch for the book was something like uh, Charles Dickens meets Blade Runner. You need something very simple obviously, to catch up Hollywood's attention. Um, so, you know, they'd gone with this, but at the time, I think it was the Golden Compass, the Philip Pullman uh, novelisation into film, had uh, just bombed a big time. And they were sort of looking at it and going, well, that's kind of a bit Victorian and a bit fantasy, and so is your book. So, we're not going to make it into a film, thank you very much. But, uh, yeah, I missed out on the Hollywood Millions with that one. But the trouble is, for, for the kind of books I do, you know, lots of people say it would make a very good anime series, and it probably would because you don't actually need a very big, you know, you just need your, your normal animators, and it doesn't cost that much to do a lovely, uh, you know, Victorian sort of Blade Runnerish city uh, with with those kind of you know animators anyway. Whereas I think it would probably cost George Lucas or Steven Spielberg just as much as Star Wars to actually do justice to. You know, something like one of my books, or even a Ian Banks culture novel. You need big, big budgets for that kind of thing. Uh, so how, how do you ended up by having the, the that nicely done trailer? Well, I, I've got Harper Collins Voyager to thank for that. Really.